All right, so we're gonna get into delta decomposition a little bit more before we move on into talking about more interactions. So this delta decomposition this is just something gonna be, that's gonna be really quick. I don't think it's gonna be 30 minutes. Uh, I'm realizing also right now that I previously filmed this and I, for some reason, my iPad or whatever just caught like half of what I filmed, so. I don't know if that was on me, so I have all this written down already. We're going to fly through this really quick, hopefully. The idea here is that when we have a potential at, for some associated um, uh, equation of motion, Klein-Gordon equation, Dirac equation, Broca equation of motion, not the Lagrangians, or yes, the Lagrangians, but when we have, in the case of a potential, right, a potential means that these things are interacting, they're not free anymore. In the case of a potential, as we're seeing right here, our equation of motion goes from this equaling zero to this equaling our potential. And we're going to see that's the case not just for Klein-Gordon case, but also for the Proca and the Lagrangian, or the, the Proca and the Dirac case also, that we're going to have this side of the equation being normal to what is free and then this just being not zero but um uh, the derivative of our potential with respect to the positions right like this not with respect to time all right so now what we want to consider is this idea of uh a, some general function that satisfies this equation and we're really just plugging, we're saying, okay, this phi sub g is some general function that's going to satisfy this equation. So we haven't really done much, right? We've just, we could see that as we, to go from here to here, we just add sub g to everything. That didn't really do much. It didn't really tell us anything. But what it's going to set us up to do is it's going to help us decompose something that's more general or understand or come to a realization that decom that we could, we might be able to decompose something that's more general into some special functions that might compose that general function. Okay. So like this, right? So we might have the blue here being a solution to our equation, but wouldn't it be nice if we had some function that made these delta functions that constructed this general function and that's exactly what we're doing right here right we have the height of the function and these multiplied by um the width or not the width but this would we have the height and we have sort of the width of each being contributed by this or by this actually so it's let me redo that. So the height, the width, and then we're multiplying by some special functions. And this, these special functions are hopefully going to give us, when we add them all up, our general function. Right? And we're going to have to also say that these obey our Klein-Gordon equation of motion, which is right here. So this here goes from general functions to a special function, right? So now... We've changed the sub g to a sub s. So I'm realizing right now my face might have been in the middle of that. We go from a sub g to a sub s. Sub g and but this right here becomes a delta function, right? Because we want these to be delta functions. All right, so now this is what our equation of motion looks like. We have our Klein-Gordon prescription. We have some special function such that it obeys our Klein-Gordon dynamics. But when it does that, it just gives us a potential that looks like a spike. Now, if you, if you can remember from our last video, the potential that looked like a spike, we're treating this now as our particle, a particle that's interacting, right? So a particle in the most fundamental sense is a spike in our field, the spike being represented by a delta function. And this sort of gets into the philosophy of 
the uh, quantum field theory a little bit when you ask, what is a particle? Right, a particle might be something that has mass, might be something that has uh, momentum or something like that, but in the deepest mathematical sense, a particle is this is mathematically a delta function on some field. And that's very interesting. We can speculate about that for a while, for a long time, try to understand why exactly mathematics sort of gives rise or gives birth to these particles by merely representing them as delta functions in some field. That's an interesting philosophical question to ask, but I'm not going to get into the philosophy of this. I'm going to, we're going to keep on going down the road here on um, quantum field theory. Anyways, so th this is exactly this, right? So if we have these delta functions in our field, the one's at x mu and the other one's at y mu, right? And we want to be able to uh, compare the two, right? We, we want to be able to, um, we have a particle and then we have a delta function at some x mu minus y mu, right? And so this interaction between x mu and y mu is mediated by this um, this guy right here, this special function, right? We haven't really said anything yet about what the structure of the special function looks like, but um, we can nevertheless postulate that this is what we want, okay? And what we're gonna do is we, we're gonna say, this is what we want, and we're gonna go to the mathematicians and say, give it to us, right? We're not gonna go ahead and like do a derivation on this. A lot of times, in physics, especially with the Lagrangians, um, especially with Lagrangians, we're going to go to mathematicians and we're going to say, you know, this is what we want, come up with it, and then we want to do stuff with it, right? It's kind of like, you know, uh, I recently had to do an order on some Sanger sequencing, right? I want to know what the sequence is. So I go, so I, I set up my samples and I send them to a company and I tell them, Tell me the sequence, <laughs> right? This isn't so, so. Mathematicians, scientists in general, do this interaction so we can get to the answer quicker. If 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 physicists again were required to do everything on their own, we would probably be stuck in the dark ages still. <laughs> Anyways, that's that's my rant there. So. We have now um, the setup for wanting to understand this guy. Okay, we want to know what this guy is. This is the enterprise of, of studying the interactions. And what we're going to find is that we're going to have one associated with the Klein-Gordon uh, dynamics. We're going to have one associated with the Dirac dynamics. It's going to look like this. And we're going to have one associated with Broca dynamics. It's going to look like this. They're all, their input values, again, are uh, two. We have two input values right? because we have, these things are comparing two points with one another, essentially, or describing the interactions between two points, actually. And what we're going to have, um, and then we're going to get some number out of that, right? and that number is going to tell us the degree of the interaction or the degree of the coupling between the interactions. Okay. And the reason we have this alpha, beta, and rho, uh, rho uh, lambda here is because this here is a scalar. It's a, just a scalar. So when we compare one scalar to another, we're just getting one value. But this here has components, and this here has components, thanks to our internal um, structure of our spinner and uh, vector fields, they, they each have components to each other. So you can think like a, a vector has components, a four vector has four components, a spinner, depending on the type of spinner. Again, we've talked about vial spinners. We've talked about Dirac spinners. Vial spinners have two components. Um, uh, Dirac spinners have four. And so these things, these things are really just going to look, uh, they're going to, we want to compare two points. Or we want to understand the interaction between two points, but we also want to understand the interaction between the components on each point, right? So we could think here, for example, that we have 
this, we have some spinner now located at some point. We have some spinner located at another point. We want to understand how this compares with this component here, how B component compares with um, A here, how C compares with A, and how D compares with A, right? And so each one of those can be stored in, say, a, a matrix entry. We do the same thing with comparing um, A to this B, B to this B, C, or C to this B, D to this B, and so on. And we can get this matrix, right? So this here, again, it's a, a spoiler alert, these are gonna be Green's functions, but these are gonna be Green's functions also. And these are gonna be Green's functions. What we're gonna see is that Green's, these Green's functions are very, very, are gonna be very important in helping us understand exactly what these interactions are like, right? And so just again, as a little bit of a teaser here, here's what some of our Green's functions are gonna look like. We're gonna, this is our one for our Klein-Gordon case, and this is the one for our spinner case, right? And then we're gonna have one for our Proca case. I didn't write that one down because you, you kind of, you're starting to see a pattern a little bit emerge where we have this factor here, we have this E factor here, this exponential, we have this here in the denominator. The only thing different here is between the Dirac case and the Spinner case is this right here. And same thing is going to be true essentially for the Proca case do it with this one little slight modification where we're going to have um, the Minkowski metric also show up. But notice again, these, this, this looks an awful lot like a uh, Fourier transformation also. The key thing to note here is that these are Fourier transformations in some sense, right? Why? Right. This is this is an interesting question. It took me a while to again to sort of be able to understand why are these Fourier transformations. Well, if you think about interactions, let's get back to this really quick. This picture right here, or this picture right here. As they stand alone, these functions don't do anything to each other. Right, they're just Dirac. They're just Dirac delta functions that, that are just standing at two points in space, not interacting with each other. So why in the world are we calling this an interaction? Something that describes an interaction. Well, when we decompose the field into when we go from uh, spatial space or whatever type of space here, and we're decomposing it into the associated frequencies. Well, those are good. It's going to look like a wave. It's going to look like a complex wave. And those waves are the things that interact with one another. So on the face of it, the delta functions alone don't interact with each other, but their associated waves do, which is why we're calling this, these guys here, uh, which is why we're calling these guys interactions these things that describe interactions. This is why the chapter, again, is describing interactions. These interactions essentially are Fourier transforms of delta functions at places in space. Right? Because, again, the delta functions don't interact, but their waves do. Right? So we have to, de we have to decompose into waves, so so we so what we have is this delta decomposition. We're decomposing our fields into these particles, our potential into these delta functions, and then we're saying, okay, here's the delta functions. Let's take a Fourier transform of those to understand how they're interacting with one another. Essentially, that's what's going on here, and we're going to see that this is uh, we're going we're going to do this with the the spinners. We're going to do this with um, scalars. We're going to do this with four vectors. Okay. Nothing should stop us, though, from doing this with other types of objects. I haven't done it with other types of ob objects, but it might be interesting to do that. Right. But that's what the enterprise of this next chapter is going to be. Is we're going to look at sort of the ramifications of these Green's functions, and we're going to study them a little bit more in depth before we get before we're done with the classical part of this book and move on to the quantum part of this book. The quantum part of this book, we're gonna realize 
is that these Green's functions, when we hack on a little term at the end here, they turn into something that we're gonna call a propagator, okay? The propagators are gonna be important in helping us understand how quantum fields, or how, how quantum fields interact with one another, right? But I'm not gonna get too ahead of myself. It's about halfway into 30 minutes again. This was just designed to get you motivated and interested in delta decomposition. So without leaving you, um, uh, again, I hope you enjoy this kind of stuff. If uh, Please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to. Um, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.